Well, good morning everyone on Wednesday the 3rd of June. The Bible says this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And this morning we rejoice with Mandy who has a special birthday today. So happy birthday Mandy from all your church family. I hope you have a really blessed day. Well, today Ed is going to uh, introduce someone else to us, so uh, we look forward to seeing who that is and hearing their story. But before we do, we're going to worship. So I'll uh, hand over to the worship team now. Good morning and welcome to day three of our daily services, which this week are all about testimonies. Uh, I hope you've been enjoying the series so far. I think it's a real privilege to hear people's stories of faith and how God has been and is working in their lives. And so I hope uh, that as you listen to these, you'll be encouraged, but also you'll get to know some of the members of our church a little bit better. 
Uh, just before we jump into today's story, let me pray. Thank you, Lord, for the joy of being able to hear these stories of faith. Thank you, Lord, that we have the technology that allows us to do that, even at this time of being apart. And we look forward to the day then we can, when we can meet back together and share testimonies of your grace and goodness. Amen. Oh, well, hi, I'm, I'm Jean, and uh, I was brought up in a Christian home in Presswood, Buckinghamshire, and much of our lives centred around the local Methodist church and its people. My brother and I attended Sunday school, and my parents were actively involved in leadership and preaching and in running a youth group. Well, our home was often full of people ranging from Methodist ministers, Cliff College students or deaconesses, young people or even children in need of a break from difficult home circumstances. So I, I learned to share not only my parents and our home, but my bedroom and sometimes even my clothes and holidays with others. In fact, I witnessed firsthand lives being helped, supported and changed by the way my parents lived and loved and the sacrifice that it often demanded. Well, when I was 13, there was a mission at our church and on the third night, I responded to Christ's call and I went forward to give my life to him. I knew he loved me and that he died in my place carrying the burden of my sin, died to save me and restore me to a right relationship with him. Well, from that moment on, I never stopped believing or doubting this. I, tr I being the word, I tried to be a good Christian. But some 20 years later, happily married with two young children, pretty stressed out, looking after our old relatives, and serving in the local church as Sunday school superintendent and youth worker, I realized something very important was missing in my Christian life and knew that God held the answer. Well, we prayed and decided to go looking and made plans to lay down our duties and look for a fellowship in which both we and our children would find what was missing. Well, Jesus says in Matthew 7, verse 7, ask and it will be given to you, seek and you will find, knock, and the door will be open to you. Well, he was indeed faithful. He led us to a loving church in Stamford, and shortly afterwards, we attended a power, praise and healing meeting advertised there. And it was during this meeting that the Lord powerfully met and spoke into my life, leading both my husband and myself to humbly recommit ourselves to Jesus Christ as Lord of our lives and to be filled with his Holy Spirit. And my mother and 37 of Kip's friends were praying for us that night. Prayer changes things. Well, this was the beginning of a life transforming and living relationship with Jesus Christ, not just a head knowledge. A new joy and peace were mine. Even sermons became more interesting and the Bible came alive as God revealed how his word shows me how to live and trust him. Trust him in each and every situation from day to day. Our eyes were open to suffering around us and very quickly we were led into ministry with people in difficult circumstances or in crisis. And several years later, whilst attending a church in Grantham, the Lord told us to nail our flag to the flagpole. That is, make a public decl declaration of our faith by getting baptised. And we did. We're not promised a carefree life, and it has been during some of the most difficult times that God has taught me the greatest lessons and often used those experiences to help others in similar situations. In 1980, my husband Kip collapsed with seizures, broke down both physically and mentally with ME, following about a month, unable to do even the simplest of things. And our world as we knew it was shattered. Further damage and breakdown followed 
as a result of initial wrongful diagnosis and treatment. And so, at 40 years of age, Kip had to retire permanently from work. There were times when I was unable to pray, only able to say the name Jesus. But I knew he was there with us. And throughout those early years, God spoke words of hope and strength and encouragement through his word and through people around us. He provided financial security as a person we barely knew offered us their home at a good price, which enabled us to live mortgage free. Also, an uncle left our children some money, which supported them through university when they were older. Psalm 28 verse 7 says, The Lord is my strength, my shield. My heart trusts in him, and I am helped. This I have proved. It's all too easy to get anxious in difficult situations, like the one we're in now. But Jesus has taught me that he is bigger than my feelings, which are often misleading and conflict with what he says and what he can do. And he says in 2 Corinthians 12 verse 9, My grace is sufficient for you. For my power, my power is made perfect in weakness. Well, in my weakness, I have experienced his wonderful gifts of grace, his wisdom, his comfort, his strength, and peace in many difficult and complicated situations. He has led me through months, months of nursing a sick and dying cancer patient, sharing our lives and loving the unlovely, a rather smelly epileptic with learning difficulties, knifed by his stepmother at four years old, frequently mugged and robbed by drug addicts, eventually dying of a broken back after one such attack but he died knowing, as he put it, his Lord and his God. We provided a home for a sexually permissive teenager who was psychologically screwed up by life and helping her to find a job. We, helping a, we were helping a dishonest teenager go straight and find a job and he disappeared off the face of the earth before he even heard he'd actually acquired one and he probably missed a good chance of sorting out his life. Loving and knowing Jesus, like any loving relationship, demands a response, demands action. Going the extra mile and often stepping out in faith into the unknown or situations that you feel utterly incapable of dealing with. But it is Christ in me. His is the power. His is the work. I'm far from perfect, and Jesus shows me that too. But as I seek his forgiveness and provide the willingness, he provides the power to live the abundant, everlasting life that he died to give me and to give you. Jesus Christ lives to love. His entire nature is one of love. His words, his actions, his wounds, his sacrifice, his rising all speak of love and it's as I respond, submit and commit my life to him each day that he has been able to work in and through me, 75 year old Grandma Jean, and share his glory, his kingdom and his power. Asking Jesus to come and reign in my life is the best and most important thing I have ever done and it's the most life-changing. Do you know him? He comes highly recommended. Well thank you Jean for sharing your story today. Um, what struck me from Jean, well and Kip's story, is how they had their life and their world turned upside down as a result of Kip's illness. The plans and dreams they had were shattered but in those desperate times and since God has remained faithful to them and not just met their needs, but often exceeded them. Jean mentioned a verse from 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, and I know it's an important and a favourite verse for them. And it says this, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. 
when we're on our knees, when we're at our wits end, when we hit rock, hit rock bottom, God is still at work. And it's often in those times we see our mighty God for who he really is. The God of power, the God of grace and the God of love. Thank you for watching today. We're going to sing again. Hebrews 6 verse 19 says, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul. So let's pray. So Father God, as we've heard this morning how Jean and Kip have been anchored into you, Lord, on their faith journey, we thank you and praise you for how you've kept Jean and Kip, 
over these years, for the way they've been your hands and feet to so many people. And we do pray for Kip's health, Lord, that you would give Kip your peace in body, mind and spirit. And for Jean, Lord, we thank you for her and the way she has used her gifts for you, Lord. We pray you will strengthen, bless and keep them. And thank you, Lord, that as we all journey on through this life, sometimes on the mountain tops, often in the valleys, Thank you, Lord, that you are with us, whether we are walking well or whether we're taking one tiny step at a time. Thank you, Lord, for your power, your grace, your strength and your love. Thank you for the hope that we have in you. And in Romans, it says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, that's the end of our service today, and Ed will be introducing someone else to us tomorrow, so do tune in, and I hope you have a blessed day. Bye for now. <laughs>